Ha, this is a fail if I ever did see one. <laughs> what a disaster. Yeah, that. Well, we'll get more into this. <laughs> Welcome to the Dynamite Gizmo Podcast, everyone, episode. 163 Whoa, 163 everyone. My volume adjusting little knobby dooby went to the it disappeared on me, so I, I kinda cut out the audio there. Did you hear that? It sounded like someone was slapping their lips. I know I just did because I was seeing if it was me, but it wasn't me, it was someone else. But it doesn't matter because this episode we got another guest on today. Can you believe it, people? Yeah, you can believe it. At this point, you can believe it. This is our what have we got? We had, we had a guest on episode four. We had, we had, we had so Cashton and uh, Jocelyn, which was episode four. We had Kyle C. Lovely Kyle C. We had, we had Rose Moulet. We had Shoe Nice. Well, Shoe Nice was before Rose, and now we got Nate is lame. Everyone, that's this episode. Nate is lame all right i'm not saying nate is lame i'm that's his username so in this episode we go over a lot of stuff a lot of stuff stuff about his life stuff about the what he does stuff about what i do we talk about frogs you'll figure you know you'll figure that out when we get into it um it was a really pleasant episode i enjoyed having him on it was a great time, and it went well. I'm not going to say a lot in these intros before the episode starts. I just need to say that, and I need to say that Janice is a lovely lady. So please enjoy this episode, everyone. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're back at it again for episode 163 of the Dynamite Gizmo podcast, and today I've got another guest on. Uh, never thought, you know... See, the thing is with this podcast is I knew someday, I knew someday I would have guests on, but, uh, you know, I didn't think it would be this, I didn't think it would be this frequent. I thought I would have a guest and then no one for a few months and then, you know, another guest again. But uh, through the people I've, I've managed to get on, they've, they've uh, connected me with other people related to those people. So I'm getting people more frequently than not. And now that I have these people on the podcasts, I feel like it's making me making it more easier for me to get more people. This is all I don't need to say any of this. Why am I saying any of this? Cuz you don't care and I don't care. But doesn't matter. Okay, so today we have a nice young fella. He's a great guy. I've been um you may or may not know who he is. He's definitely more popular than me. I mean, anyone's more popular than me. Uh, I ha- I'm a nobody. Yeah, I, mean, yeah, I don't have to tell you. But anyway, uh, so I would just like to introduce our guest for today on episode 163. It is the man himself, Nate is Lame, ladies and gentlemen. Hello. Hi. Uh, my name is Nate. Nate is Lame. A uh, little bit ableist. I wish I would have thought about that when I was naming the darn channel. Uh, <laughs> hi. Uh, it's it's good to be on, Justin. Yes, and it's great to have you on. Um why why is Nate lame? Uh, you know what? I think if you just come out and you say Nate is lame, everyone just expects, okay, yeah, Nate is lame, and I don't have any expectations for him. Uh, so if I disappoint people, it's like, yeah, it's expected. But if I do something half-decently, then it's like, oh, that was pretty neat. Um, 
So I, I think it's just a matter of public perception anyway. It takes a lot of stress off of me. Yeah, I, I like your approach. I, I tend to do shit like that myself as well. You know, you want to set you want to set your expectations low so that people only can climb upwards. If you set the expectations too high, then you got nowhere to go but down. You know, you know it sucks. Is um I learned that from Diary of Wimpy Kid 2 Roger Rules. <laughs> I oh, just yeah. internalized it. Right. You know, the older I get, the more I realize that Roger Keffley was right about everything. <laughs> I used to, I loved those books when I was a child. They were stellar, uh, they were. the first four. Yeah. And then Cabin Fever was pretty good, too. Well, there's like there's like 20 of them now, isn't there? There's a lot. There's too many. That kid is still in middle school. Did you know that? <laughs> uh, no. He's still in middle school. He hasn't left. He hasn't gone on to high school or anything like that, which is a bummer. Well, I feel like, I feel like all cartoon characters just kind of stay where they, you know, are set. Yeah, I just think um, with Diary of Wimpy Kid specifically, I think that series would really be amazing if uh, like Greg Heffley grew up and we could follow him and watch yeah. him be like a narcissist and then get his butt kicks and they could be like a like a reverse Breaking Bad where you have this bad person slowly <laughs> turning good. Yeah. And I don't know, it just gets more and more mature and darker. He starts using some dirty words here and there. Maybe he'll kiss a girl or something like that and... God, that'd be so good. I'm getting myself pumped up just thinking about that. That's a good idea. That is, you know, it's like, uh, well, I guess Rugrats is a good example. You remember they yeah, grew Rugrats up. Yeah, Rugrats was great. They had, they had their own show. You should you should approach the guy and give him that idea. Whatever his <laughs> name is, I can't remember. Um, uh, It was Jeff Kinney. He said in an interview that he would never age Greg Heffley up because he thought that Greg would be a really sad adult. But I'm like, dude, sad cartoon characters like all the rage right now. All right, you're back. Oh, man. hey. You, you kind of cut out there for a second. Oh, I gotcha. Well, I got it on a, I got it on audio anyway. Yeah. Well, no, it's fine. It, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. Whatever. Doing, doing, okay. doing interviews over Skype, you're going to have issues. I mean, everyone has them. It's, it's not a big deal. But actually, the funny thing is, like, we were right before we were recording, I mentioned your terrarium in the background, and you said you got frogs in there. And, like, <laughs> last episode, I was actually talking about how I used to catch frogs as a child. And so... No way. Like, you're, Oh, you're the fro Licking Frogs <laughs> podcast that you did. Yeah. Yeah, that one. I didn't actually lick the frog. I just uh, titled it that just to, you, you know... Should you should have. You should have. <laughs> I don't think they're psychedelic frogs. They were just like, you know, gross prawn, pond frogs. But the frog I had, well, I, f I found these. I found oh, yeah. these big, big frogs. Like they were massive. Me and my friend used to catch frogs all the time, and I lost it. It fell. The thing jumped out of my hands and fell down into behind his deck, and there was no way of getting to it. And I don't think the frog had any way of getting out. So I'm sure it just died in there. There's probably f frog bones oh. still to this day underneath his deck. That's a bummer. Man, if anything <laughs> happened to my frogs, I'd be like heartbroken. Uh, why, their names why is are... There... Oh, yeah? What are their names? Uh, their names are Podrick and Sir Davos of House Seaworth after the uh, Game of Thrones characters. Ah. Um, they're wonderful, fat, stupid boys. I think they're gay. I think they got that chemical that Alex Jones was talking about because they are raging. It's wonderful. That's perfect. Why is the glass duct tape? Did you break it or something? <laughs> uh, so what happened is um, with, with terrariums, you get like little heaters so it's not freezing cold in there because frogs like things to be warm. Uh, what, what happened was that's an old heating pad and it uses like an adhesive, like a sticker on the other end. Well, that sticker got old. So I was like, well, I don't want to throw it away because it's like 120 bucks. So I'm just going to duct tape it. So it's like really DIY, but it looks like garbage for podcasts. So <laughs> no, it's I mean, duct tape is what's holding up this backdrop right here. Are you serious? Yeah. I have okay. The room I'm the room I'm in right now is extremely small. Uh, you can't really tell on camera, but there's literally enough room for me to squeeze into this area and sit down, and that's about it. The way I have it arranged. So I do have like a stand for this backdrop, 
but I can't use it because there's not enough room. So I just had to duct tape it to the wall. You know, it's it's funny that you bring that up. I was just thinking about this before I came on is that it's all about perspective with this whole thing. Like if you look, my room is immaculate, but what you don't see is the giant pile of clutter right over there. Right. See, you're seeing my nice bed, but you're not seeing that squirrel with its middle fingers raised right over there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, Do you think I'm joking? No. Well, Do you think I don't have a squirrel flipping people off right there? I want to see it. I, I'm not goofing. I literally what? have a squirrel uh, <laughs> flipping people off. Is it taxidermy? Yeah, it's taxidermy. <laughs> What, how did There's... you get the squirrel? Did you kill that thing? <laughs> oh, God, no, no. Um, what happened, there's there's this record store in Savannah, Georgia called Graveface, and it's right next to this big old park. And so every day, the owner of that record store would get up in the morning, drive down to work, and he'd park. And on his way, walk into the building, he'd see all these dead squirrels, and it bummed him out. And one day, he was just like, I want to immortalize these little bastards. Oh, you yeah. know, I want to give them a proper send off and, you know, capture them in their true essence. Right. So he got his buddy to taxidermy them with their uh, little middle paws sticking up. And it has like a little plaque. This one says, uh, eat shit and die, <laughs> which is my favorite. Whoa, that's so cool. It's it's wonderful. Um, I've wanted to buy one for ages. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, the person I was living with at the time was like, no, you can't have a squirrel. And I was like, OK, Uh and thankfully we broke up and now I was free to get that squirrel. Perfect. So it's like, you know, it's it's kind of like a little uh, my petty revenge. Yeah, I it, guess. All, it all worked out in the end. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's my favorite little boy. His name's a uh, raccoon. Ra- raccoon. Like your your band, Raccoon Tour. A little. I mean, like not related, but kind of. I mean, yeah. my my girlfriend right now recommended that name and I was like, OK, oh, everything yeah. in my life is raccoons. <laughs> why do you like raccoons so much uh in fact i have the beanie on right now i don't know if you can see it yeah. uh but raccoons when i was a kid a raccoon went around my neighborhood and it killed everybody's pet cats oh wow like it just went from backyard to backyard to backyard and if your cat was outside your cat got gutted damn um and we were all kids, and so that morning, uh, the morning after the massacre, everybody was like, hey, have you seen Whiskers anywhere? Have you seen Mr. Mittens? Oh. And then, you know, Dad opens up the front, uh, the back porch, like, oh, no. Uh, and he goes, honey, could you come see this? And the kid's like, what's going on? What's going on? And then they see their cat gutted on their back oh, patio. God. Um, and so everyone was really sad at the bus stop that morning. Yeah. And... I don't know. I have this sick, twisted respect for that raccoon. You know? Yeah. That dumb little mongrel made his way through our neighborhood and really made an impact on a lot of kids' day. And, you know, I aspire to be that savage. So is was that at all an inspiration in the title of your band name? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, for folks who don't know, my band is called Raccoon Tour. And it's a direct reference to the raccoon that toured my neighborhood and ah, just murdered everybody. Because raccoon see. adventure sounds stupid. Raccoon <laughs> massacre is a little try hard. Yeah. I also liked your your other small band name that you had called ST Demon Seed. I watched <laughs> that video. Fuck, that's a good name. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I will never come up with anything as good as the whole ST Demon Seed saga. That was incredible did you, did you guys just create that name just to perform on stage that day yeah literally we haven't revived it um almost everybody in raccoon tour was in st demon seed yeah uh it's just i don't want to disrespect the name by reusing it you know right um so yeah st demon seed and it was cool because it was at a school talent show mm-hmm. and we couldn't go on stage and say hi we're st demon seed so we could change it to saint demon seed but for the youtube oh, video nice. um you know and you know what's really cool about that story what's that uh we were only planning on doing like one song and calling it yeah. good but yeah. the kids running it were like dick holes you know like i said in the video yeah, right and so we got together like, okay, we know a few more songs. Let's crank out a toy on Pilot's Jam. And um, basically, afterwards, the kid came up to me and he was in my face. And he's like this little freshman kid, blonde, blue eyes. Hitler would have loved him. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 
he was like 14 years old and he was getting in my face and going, man, you ruined the talent show. You destroyed it. I'm going to make sure you're suspended. I'm going to get you detention. I'm going to ruin your freaking life. And I was like, okay. And he, he made a very serious point about making sure I knew, Nate, you are disqualified from the $100 grand prize. Oh. Um, which is a bummer. But then we uploaded the video on YouTube and it blew up way more than it deserved to. Right. And instead of making a hundred dollars, it made close to three grand. Well, that's awesome. So, um, but I, I, I hope, even, I hope he knows. Even, even that whole performance was a disaster. Not on your oh, part, but like it was the, on my part. The, well, the microphone well. cut out. The lights were shutting on and off. And yeah, you know, like, and obviously they didn't expect you to sing another song. So like when you guys finished the first song, they shut the lights off and you guys are just sitting in darkness <laughs> for like two minutes. Oh my God. Um, if my guitarist Trey Wells didn't have his microphone on, that would have been a total shit show. But you know, the luck of the Irish, I guess I'm not Irish, but <laughs> you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I've celebrated enough St. Patrick's Day. I'm sure I had some reserved in my tank or whatever. Uh, <laughs> man, that was so close to being just embarrassing. Yeah. Well, you know? it, it, uh, if it, without the context, it's super cringy. Oh, yeah. Just watching it. But like when you know what, you, what you're doing and what the plan is, then it's, then it's like, okay, I get what's going on here. And the I will that, own it. It's yeah. super cringy. Right, but I mean, if you watch the video, you you produce the video in a way that explains it, you know, in full detail as to what's going on. So it's actually not cringy. If we if you were to just watch the video without the context, then I think it would be cringy for sure. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, you know, I just think that people respond better to things if they feel like they're let in on the joke. Yeah. In, you know, in certain scenarios. Like but if you're like an Andrew Andy Kaufman or something like that, then perhaps yeah. not. Yeah, exactly. But I'm not smart enough to be Andy Kaufman. Oh so. man, I love Andy Kaufman. Goodness gracious! Have, um, have you have you seen the the Jim, uh, Jim Carrey documentary on YouTube about him playing Andy Kaufman in that movie? I know that he was a dick during yeah. the whole process he was, because he was com- he was in character the entire time he never stopped being andy kaufman you know i think that method actors like that it's it's overkill it's obnoxious and if he wasn't jim carrey he wouldn't have gone away with it right um like robert de niro robert de niro is a method actor yep. but he's not obnoxious he doesn't intrude in people's way Rather, if he's getting into character or something like that, he will spend a day, you know, if it's a mechanic, he will wear a mechanic's belt and, like, get familiar with it. So when he's on screen, it's like, whoop, he pulls out a wrench or something like that. Um, You know, but folks like Jim Carrey, Jared Leto, sending, like, used condoms and stuff to people, you know, don't do that. And that's shitty. (laughs) You know, it it, it is shitty in the fact that he's a dickhead to all these people, but I'm wondering if he didn't do that, would it be such a respected performance if he hadn't done that, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, I've seen a lot of respectable performances from people who don't act like dickheads. And he's yeah. done a lot of respectable performances without being a dickhead. I think it might have been like a publicity stunt on his end. Um, but I haven't yeah. seen the movie. Um, you know, I I really want to get more into Andy Kaufman and really explore his uh, – comedy before i you know allow myself to watch it's like reading the book before watching the movie you know yeah exactly do you follow any comedians like do you like comedy stand-up comedy Um, specifically a little bit i used to be really into stand-up comedy when i was a kid i used to do it and stuff oh you did it i did um i entered in a stand-up comedy contest when i was about 15 or so it was through my church group. So like it was like 40, 50 churches uh, participating. And I had to do a stand-up comedy bit about religion to religious oh. people and not <laughs> offend them. Oh, shit. Um, and that was really brutal. I was like, again, 14, 13 years old at the time. So yeah. I was young. Um, but I took second place. Oh, so that nice. was pretty awesome. And now you're not religious, right? 
No, no, Correct. very much not so. Were you religious at that time? Or yes. Never? Oh, you were? Yes, I was. I used to really be into it. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, I got edgy. Um, I started watching these atheist YouTube videos to kind of get back at the parents. <laughs> uh, but then it became more than YouTube videos. And I was like, oh, no. In fact, I'm seeing on your arm, I'm seeing a tattoo uh, that says, like, Darwin. Yeah. Does that have anything to do with anything? That's... Well, that's just kind of like, I got this tattoo. This was my first tattoo I got when I was 18. I'm 26, or I'm 25 right now. Um, yeah, I've, I've, when I was about 14, I decided I'm not going to be religious. I was focused on more of the science and just, you know, uh, I just want to focus on the facts. I want to focus on what I can actually interpret the stuff i can you know take the stuff that i want i want i wanted to take information that actually i can prove you know yeah i, I don't want to because i was religious a little bit i figured you know because my whole family believes in this specific thing i'm i have to believe in this thing but when i was about 14 i realized well it doesn't make any sense and they don't have any proof to back up their statements and so I'd rather just believe in something that I can actually physically understand and interpret. And so when I was 18, I was like, I'm just going to get this Darwin. So it's 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 the Jesus fish. Yeah. It's, it's got legs and it says Darwin instead of Jesus. So that's just that's just my way of saying I believe in evolution. That's actually really clever. I really yeah. like the Jesus fish with legs. That's really clever and I actually really like that. Yeah. I didn't. Um, I, I didn't come up with this idea. Like I totally ripped this off the internet. But as soon as I saw it, I'm like, I want that tattoo. Well, I haven't seen that before, so I saw it on you for the first <laughs> time. So I guess you own it in my eyes. <laughs> yeah. You know. Like, so if I see it on the internet, it's like, oh, they stole it from Justin. <laughs> yeah. And like I also have like a dead mouse tattoo over here, and then an, an Illuminati tattoo, which it's not. It's the Illuminati symbol, but it's not. I didn't get it because of the Illuminati. I got it because the Egyptian, the Egyptians actually were the first people to use this symbol, and that is the inspiration for this. I really like. I really like Egypt. I really like the pyramids. I like the mystery behind it, and so that's where you know this one comes from. And so you kind of forget about your tattoos after you get them when you have them for a few years, and so you don't realize when people have a first. Uh, uh, interaction with you they're looking at your tattoos and they're judging you by your tattoos right off the bat but the person with the tattoo you know kind of forgets that they're there so you you got to kind of take that into consideration that you know if you're going to get tattoos you got to be aware of the fact that people are going to stare at them and try to figure you out through your tattoos and it's not like it's not like i'm you know, trying to make a big statement or anything. And maybe I don't even like the tattoos that I got when I was younger, but I, st I have them and I can't get rid of them. It's something yeah. you don't think about when you get the tattoos. But I gotcha. But I still, when I got them, I'm like, I might regret these when I'm older, but I just always think, you know, I, I wanted them at the time, so at that time in my life, it meant something to me. So it's going to mean something to me for the rest of my life. It's a snapshot of who you were in that point. And no matter what you do, that's always going to be set. So I don't think that's much different than a tattoo. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I'd agree with that statement. Yeah. Um, on the topic of the Illuminati, did you know that I'm in the Illuminati? <laughs> no. Here's a fun fact. Uh you know, my strategically placed uh, play button over there. <laughs> yeah, as I soon as you that. hit 100,000 subs on YouTube, you get a little black envelope in the mail, okay? Oh, yeah. Um, and it's got like a red wax stamp and everything like in the olden days. Mm -hmm. And when you open it, it's like cardstock, like it's hard stuff. And it's like, hey, uh, it's Jay-Z. Do you want to join me in the <laughs> Illuminati? Uh, all you got to do is just send us like 5% of your ad revenue, you okay. know, and you get to attend all these wild satanic parties where we sacrifice children 
and we order cabinets from Wayfair and then we see what kids we get, you know? <laughs> Hell yeah. Um, and so I, I wrote back and I said, sure, I'll, I'll join the Illuminati. Um, and so I got an invitation to the first Illuminati party. And basically it was like in this old warehouse, you know, like you'd think that the Illuminati would be able to like afford a nicer place. Right. But it was like Harry Potter. Okay. Like, you know, you have like those shitty little tents, but inside it's like glorious inside. They had it like done up. Um, and who else was there? Uh, Shay Carl. It was in Boise. Oh, wow. Uh, so Shay Carl was Damn. there. Um, and who else was there? Um, Alex Clark was another YouTuber. Uh, he's definitely in the Illuminati. Uh, he also does animations and stuff like that. Uh, the Odd One's Out is not in the Illuminati. I would have thought he would be in the Illuminati. Huh. You know, he's got like 14 million subs. Like, come on, dude. You should be running the Illuminati. Yeah. Um, he probably has more. He gets like a million every other day, it seems like. Um, and so, yeah, the Illuminati party was really chill. The music sucked. I'll say that right off the bat. It was really bad. Was it so? It was only those three YouTubers. Was there anyone else there? I didn't recognize any of the other ones. I thought they were like politicians or something, but they were boomers, man. I wasn't gonna talk to them. I'm surprised Shay Carl was there. He kind of yeah. Oh, he, he kind of fell off the bandwagon. Yeah, he did. Um, yeah, he's like super Illuminati. He's been in there for ages. Wow. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah, and they also have like those little corns as well. They serve those. You remember corns? from like that Tom Hanks movie, Big. Oh, yeah. I yeah, it was like that. Uh, that's one of my favorite movies. Um, they were serving those, but I didn't recognize any other food. Anyway, uh, I decided to just decline their invitations and just, you know, hold on to my membership. Uh, I lost my wallet. Otherwise, I'd, I'd show you my membership card. Right. You got credentials. Yeah. Oh, sure do. It's really cool. Um, and the best part about being Illuminati, I'm almost done, uh, is that... Um, once they release, uh, cause the thing is they invented the coronavirus, you know, they did COVID-19. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't China. It was the Illuminati. Yeah. Um, the cool thing is that I get vaccines early. Oh, wow. Uh, so as soon as it starts evolving and then it starts, you know, it's like a plague incorporated that phone yeah. game. Yeah. Once they start getting like the, uh, necro, what's it called? Necromosis or something like that. Once they get into the really scary symptoms, um, I'll be ready. So I'm not going to die. So, you know, uh, you might want to start working on your stats if you want to you know, not die. <laughs> yeah, I got to get 100,000 subs real quick here. I'm going to get coronavirus. Well, we're expected to launch it. And what day? I have to check my calendar of when the uh, different evolution. Uh, right. It will be launched on May 18th. So that's when it's going to be planted in Taiwan. I don't know when it's going to spread over here. So I'd say about mid-October, something like that is how long you have. Shit. I don't got much but, time. Yeah. But even, you know, if it doesn't work out, I will definitely uh, give you a nice layer of recommendation because I really appreciate your hustle, man. Yeah. You've done like over 160 podcasts. Yeah. Yeah. I know. That's incredible. You're just doing it for the passion. You're doing it because you just enjoy it. Yeah. Well, ever since I was 12, I really wanted to be a YouTuber. Before that, when I was about 10 years old, which would have been 2005 or something like that, because that was right when YouTube launched, was in 2005, mm -hmm. I had a video camera... My mom got me one for my birthday or something. And I used to watch this show in Canada. It was called Being Ian. And that guy was, you know, it was it, the, the, it was like a cartoon only made in Canada. And the, the, the plot of the show was that this kid had a camera and he would film everything and he wanted to be a director. And so that's kind of what I wanted to be as a child. And then YouTube came along and I was like, well, this is it. This is my thing. And so since like pre well the inception of YouTube, I've been on YouTube, but you know, I still haven't really gotten the success that I'm looking for. And I it was around two thousand sixteen when I I really found a passion for podcasts. Like still to this day, I pretty well only listen or watch podcasts. Um I don't watch TV, I don't even have cable or satellite, I just, podcasts are my thing, and 
yeah, and I'm like, this, in my mind, I'm like, this is what I got to do. And the fact that I'm able to keep doing this and keep enjoying doing this means that I'm heading in the right direction. At least I think so. And I know I'm not there yet, but I feel like I can get there if I continue to do this. Because, it, you know, becoming a success on YouTube is not an easy endeavor for anyone. You know, it's a it's pretty not, stupid endeavor, if I have to say. It's not something you can just like whip out a camera and expect to make a viral video the next day. It could take years and years, or it could, or it could take a day if you get lucky. Like it's all random. It's a hundred percent luck. Yeah, and so even if I don't become a success, I still enjoy doing this, and I don't see myself stopping doing this. Originally, I wanted to be like a sketch comedy person on YouTube. And if you look at my older content, it's all sketch comedy. That's all it mm -hmm. was. And then, and like my, my, my podcast that I'm making, I still want to make it like a comedy uh, style podcast. I get a lot of inf inspiration from stand-up comics in general because pretty well every stand-up comic has a podcast. And so I watch a lot of those as well. But yeah. Hell yeah. You ever do like open mics or anything? Got like material written out? I've thought about it. I would love to try it. I actually, when I went to Vancouver Film School, I there was a kid in Yo. my class. There was a kid in my class who wanted to be a stand-up comic, and just a few months ago, he was actually featured on Conan O'Brien with his stand-up comedy. So I was like, man. Like, I was super happy for him, you know, just to see someone that I went to school with actually succeed and use their talents, you know, to succeed in the, in the way that they ended up on something like Conan O'Brien. And that really inspired me, and it kind of made me want to pursue stand-up comedy. But right now, I'm living in, like, a shitty, small-ass town in rural Alberta, Canada, where there's nothing within three hours of me that I could do stand-up comedy. But, like, I mean, just right now, I'm just focusing on this, mostly, is just getting, trying to find a success with this podcast. You know, um, I think that people point at numbers a little too much sometimes. Um, I was reading this great article the other day, and all you really need is a 100... A thousand, one thousand really, really, really devoted fans. Um, because the thing is, I have a lot of subs on my YouTube, uh, but not all of them are super engaged. Not all of them watch everything I do. They probably just watched one video and like, oh, he's cool. And then they hit the sub button and never watch me again or interact or anything like that. Um, you know, so I feel like looking at subs and views, that kind of inflates, uh, you know, people's Percept uh, perception of success. But if I had a thousand people really tuned in to what I make and I'm able to get a hundred dollars per year from them, you know, if I were to do shows or sell t shirts and on average a thousand people would spend a hundred dollars per year on stuff I make, that's a hundred thousand yeah, dollars per year. Right. That's like, you know, top 1% Bernie Sanders is coming for your butt kind of money, you know? Like, so, uh, there's there's OG YouTubers who have millions of subscribers, but their vi their videos average maybe like 1,000 to 2,000 views because they were popular at one point, but maybe they just stopped making content, their consistency dropped off, and the f when that happens, the fans go away. They don't unsubscribe because they just don't think about it. So they're still subscribed yeah. to those channels, but they just don't watch the content anymore. So there's there's all kinds of factors at play. Having <clears throat> having a lot of subs is kind of a double edged sword, because on one hand you you get you get cool stuff from YouTube. You get the Illuminati, you get the play button, and all that jazz. But um, YouTube says, okay, this guy has a hundred thousand subs. So we're expecting some good stuff from him, and if you know you're not working the algorithm, if you're not being consistent. Uh, your views will drop and YouTube will say, oh, well, this guy's a fluke, so we're just going to bury him or something like that. That's what I'm fighting with right now uh, with my channel because my consistency has been 
awful, not great, bad, you know, 2020 depression, all that jazz. Yeah. Um, but I really do admire your consistency because you're kicking butt, dude. Well, yeah, I appreciate that. And I, I understand that um, consistency is one of the key factors to making it on YouTube, if not the 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 only, you know, the number one factor for... Because the whole algorithm is kind of uh, super confusing. You know, I don't think anybody's got the algorithm figured out. Even The, the algorithm's even, stupid. E- even the people at YouTube don't even have that shit figured out. <laughs> it's, it's a weird, multi-faceted beast. I think it's... I think the reason they keep it so hush-hush... Um, the reason they keep it so hush-hush is because it's just so complex and there are so many factors that feed into it and um basically i i've i've spoken with an engineer at youtube at vidcon actually and i asked him about it and they just get so dismissive with questions because they don't know where to begin with answers uh the way that the algorithm treats children uh children's channels or cooking channels or beauty channels or animation channels it is super adaptive it's crazy right um you know they're just a few universal rules be good a uh, good thumbnail, good title, and be consistent, and that's it. Right. So, it's a weird, weird monster, man. Yeah, and it's it wasn't always this way. Like I feel like, uh, really, around the time that the ad apocalypse happened was when we really started to see some major changes happen. Yeah. Like when when PewDiePie had that whole controversy, where like Wall Street was trying to. Do, do you know about that? Yeah, I do. I was like a teenager and I was like, why should I care about this? But now I'm like, I do care about this. Yeah. Yeah, right. I do remember that. So like, how long have, were you like, did you watch a lot of YouTube videos before you started uploading to YouTube? Oh yeah, so many. Um, I started really digging into YouTube around uh, 2009, 2008 or something like that. Like I was in, my mom was a music teacher at my elementary school. So every day after school, I would just sit on these computers and watch, ooh, I just watch YouTube all day. Yeah. And, um, you know, stuff like Fred Figglehorn, Smosh, <laughs> the good old stuff. Yeah. Because um, that was comedy back then. Right. And um, that was like, dang, this stuff is so cool. And then I grew up and I was like, oh my God, Swoozy is incredible. Uh, I like how he tells stories and draws pictures. And, you know, it just evolves from there. And as a kid, every kid wants to be a YouTuber. Yeah. Everybody wants to be a YouTuber. And, you know, I know how to make video. I know how to work uh, programs. I know how to write and I know how to speak. You know, I've always been a performer my entire life. Uh, You just put all those factors together and um, you end up ruining a lot of career choices for your future. Right. But if you do it properly, you can make it work. Oh yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So but, when you, oh, when, yeah, you yeah. when you started doing like this animation stuff, did you already have experience in that, or did you like just figure it out as you went? Uh, boy, you could pull up some of my older videos because they look yeah. awful. They look I, rough. Well, I did. I did um, watch. I went back to your first video and I watched it, and it's def. You can definitely see the difference. Yeah, I appreciate that. It, it is totally learning. Um, you just take it one video at a time. Where you're like, I don't like how this line looks. How do I smooth that out? Oh, there's a button for that. So now every line looks a lot smoother. How do I fix these outlines? Oh, there's a way to do that. Uh, just learning from your peers and stuff like that. Um, last July, in fact, we're close to a year anniversary, uh, to this day, actually, I got to attend VidCon and that was amazing. It was my second year at VidCon, but this time I was going in not as like a newbie. Yeah. Um, I was going in, I had established myself and I had friends and connections and I got to stay in a house with a lot of YouTubers that I grew up watching. Oh, sweet. And that was incredible. So it's like, you're watching somebody as a kid. You know, you're eating cereal or something like that before school and you're watching them on your laptop. And then years later, you're still sitting down and eating cereal, but they're right next to you. And you're just like, hey, do you want to see a funny video? And they're like, yeah, sure. And it's 
surreal and you kind of have to adapt really quickly because every bone in my body wants to freak out and yell and go, oh my God. Um, but I can't do that because we're peers now right. and you have to like shut yourself down. Um, but I found that I do get much more meaningful um, interactions with people, you know, by approaching them as my peer. Yeah. Like I've always, Which, I've always thought about what it would be like to actually meet the YouTubers that I, you know, subscribed to and watched my whole life. Like, what would that be like? And then, like a few episodes ago, I actually did an interview with Shoe Nice. I saw, and I was like, the fact that he was even willing to come on my shitty ass podcast was like mind blowing to me. And it's not like I met him in person. But I was still super nervous to just do it over Skype because I was like, I grew up watching this guy and it was super weird. And, but I did it. And that's I just, incredible. I just, I don't know. I just did it. And it, I think it went pretty well. I but, haven't watched it yet. So I can't pipe in and say, oh, yeah, that went well or no, that went terribly. You should be ashamed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I feel like, but I feel like, you know, I've done 160 some episodes. I feel like, that was a good practice for me to actually, you know, learn how to communicate through the camera and not have too much fucking um, dead dead air or whatever. Yeah, you're a like, pro. If I if I were to just start my podcast right away with interviews right off the bat, it would have been a shit show. Like if you actually watch like my my fourth episode of the podcast, um, the fourth one I ever made, I actually had two of my best friends on as a guest and it was like awkward and it was not, <laughs> it did not turn out as well as I had hoped it would. So yeah, I feel and that. I feel like I feel like in my mind I kind of told myself I should just do a shit ton of episodes just by myself so that I actually get comfortable in front of the camera before I start even interviewing anyone. I gotcha. That's really badass yeah well i think that's really cool yeah and you know what else is really neat is that as soon as you do blow up everyone's gonna have this giant catalog to dig through yeah. um because that is actually really cool um because i wish that i was i kept a low profile before i threw out my big swinger boys right um you know you, you sometimes i make a video and i'm like i know this is gonna blow up and it does blow up uh like my high school video which turned out to be my hugest video ever. And I'm so proud of that stupid video. You upload it and you're like, this has all the right ingredients. I believe in this and it works out. Um, it's just, I threw that out way too early. I didn't have anything under my belt for people to look back on. But if you make this giant catalog, um, you know, of let's just say 160 episodes of a podcast, uh, then you have those viewers and they're like, oh my God, I can dig right into this. So then everything else grows. It's just like a spontaneous, uh, you know, rapid succession. Basically yeah. everything blows up. Right. But you're, you're like a different, you you can be categorized differently because you don't have a lot of videos on your channel, but yet you have almost 300,000 subscribers and you're getting, you know, thousands of views on every video. And so, like, when when you started your channel, it, it obviously mm -hmm. wasn't like that right off the bat. Oh, no. <clears throat> so, like, how long did it take before you actually started to see income or even views? Yeah. Basically, what I did, I'm really happy I did this. Um, I spent a month beforehand. I was like, I want to make a YouTube video. I, I want to make a YouTube channel this summer. So I spent a month just watching YouTube channel tutorials and stuff like that. Just people explaining the algorithm, explaining monetization, best practices, thumbnails, all that basic stuff. Um, and I swallowed it. You know, I internalized the hell out of it. And then I was like, okay, I'm ready to do a YouTube video. And then I make a YouTube video and then I make another YouTube video and then I make another YouTube video. Um, so I was doing uh, the best practices anyway. And I'm so proud of myself that I did. Um, and, you know, you get 15 subscribers from your first video and you're like, oh my God, this is amazing. And then you get 100 subscribers. Oh my God. And so you post that on Facebook like, guys, I just got 100, you know, with that, I, I love that Facebook memories feature because I can pull up in my Facebook and I'm like, 
seeing myself three or four years ago freaking out. Guys, I got a hundred subs. Um, but for me, uh, it happened fairly quickly. Within a year, I had a hundred k. Um, I remember I was in my high school cafeteria waiting for my ride to come, and I just had my phone on this table. There was no one else in this giant cafeteria. It's just me alone by myself, hunched over my phone. I'm just watching the. Uh, subscriber taker just go doot 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 and I'm ready to take a screenshot and memory you know commemorate this whole thing my English teacher was like waiting for it because he was like my best friend at the time um and you know it just do 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 and then it just changed and there was no fanfare there was no music there was no sound effect it was just 100k and I was yeah. like cool and I ran <laughs> down the hallway really quickly I was like 17 or 18 and I like pounded on his door he was in the middle of a meeting but he looked at me through the window and i was like and he was like yeah awesome um so it happened really quickly um it it was just a really steady uh growth and then it plateaued so i have a little bit more freedom to experiment anyway which i feel i'm in right now um so it's just been i've been really fortunate i've been really lucky yeah you know like I, I I I was watching your your unboxing video of your uh, YouTube uh, hundred thousand plaque or whatever the play button, and like you didn't even you didn't seem excited. You seemed super calm and like almost not impressed by it. You know, when you watch stuff on YouTube and there's there's a lot of editing. You know, uh, people put on an act. People, you know, yeah. freak out and that kind of deal. But the thing is, when they ship that thing to you, it's this brittle black cardboard box. And inside is like, you know, a cardstock letter. Um, it's printed. It's been reprinted hundreds of thousands of times. So my little cardstock letter is not special. Uh, when you open it up, it's this cheap piece of wood. And, you know, it has like some plastic reflective, you know, thing behind it. And... You know, they have the thing inscribed to Nate is lame for 100,000 subs. And you can see where, you know, it's been, uh, what's the term? There, it, it's, it's designed anyway, so everyone gets the same, uh, you know, design. And they just kind of copy and paste your name yeah, in it. Yeah. And it all just kind of set in where I was like, this is a lot bigger than me. And this is a lot less anticlimactic right. um, than what I was anticipating. So it was a little melancholy a okay. bit. Like, I was very happy i've been dreaming about that since i was a kid right um it's just you expect like this giant hunk of metal or something like that but it's just you know it's nothing yeah i guess so like i i, I i'm oh, just yeah. i'm just in your position but you know because i what i'm saying is like i haven't reached that level at all so in my mind i just imagine it being incredible but i'm sure if i was in that position as well i'd probably react the same way it's not the grass is, you know, always greener on the other side until you get there. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I love that dumb play button. I think it's really cool, even if it is just a cheap hunk of wood. Yeah. Uh, you know, with some silver paper glued over top of it. Right. You know, uh, it's just, it's more of an internal thing where I'm proud of it. The pride doesn't come from that. It comes from... Me, I thought it would be a lot more, wow, this thing is so cool. I'm never going to, you know, this is my most treasured possession. You know, it's a piece of wood. Yeah. The, it's, it's, the, it's the accomplishment that comes with it, you know. I, I think something very similar to that, um, I was really fortunate uh, at that VidCon experience that I told you about. I got to go over to the Odd Ones Out house, oh, yeah. uh, James Rallison's house. Yeah which is beautiful. It's an amazing, incredible house. He's an amazing, incredible guy. And in his living room, um, on right next to his TV, he has his 10 million diamond play button. Right. And it was just sitting there gathering dust with like, you know, all these uh, decorations and stuff that he has. Wow. And it was just so unceremonious. Like I'd only seen and heard about this and it's just right, right. there. And I was kind of dumbstruck and I was like, oh my God, am I allowed to touch this? And he was like, oh, yeah, yeah, go for it. He's like flipping eggs at a stove. He's like, yeah, go for it, man. Oh, and I was wow. like, oh, God. And I grabbed it, and I was expecting like angels to sing or something, but it's just, you know, it's a big, heavy rock, you yeah. know? 
uh, a lot of it's just for show. Right. You yeah, know? it's it's so weird that the differentiation between, you know, actually reaching that level and then, you know, like not reaching that level. And you just imagine how amazing it was. But then when you get to meet the people, they're just people. It's just regular lives. It's nothing special. Yeah. Like you hear that, you know, and people can say, yeah, I'm just a regular guy. But you don't internalize and rationalize that until you are in that position. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and so I, I always want to conduct myself where I come across as a real person who just got lucky. Um, cause that's exactly how I feel. Um, you know, I never want to be pretentious or try to appear larger than life or anything. Cause I'm not, I can't uphold that. That sounds exhausting. Yeah. When you, you know, when you went to VidCon, did you have fans there? I, I actually did. It yeah. was amazing. Um, <laughs> It's it's really cool because I feel like a celebrity like one week a year, except for 2020 because, you know, COVID, <laughs> yeah. uh, COVID sucks. Right. Um, but it's really cool because I get to feel like a celebrity one week and God, it was amazing. Um, I, I've, I've had kids cry meeting me. Wow. Which is amazing uh, to have that, you know, to have someone look up to you and get that excited that they have an emotional response. That is so flattering and yeah. so incredible. Yeah. Um, at VidCon, I I was doing autographs at a, a booth and the line got so long that we had to be escorted away from security because we were causing a fire hazard. Whoa. That had never happened to me in my entire life. That probably will never happen again. I just think it's amazing that I get to say that I caused a public safety hazard <laughs> by just being somewhere. Right. That was amazing. Um, yeah. And... I think that's a lot cooler than a play button is having yeah. an interaction. Yeah. That's the stuff that like, that's as good as it sounds. That's the stuff that's as good as you imagine it being. Absolutely. You know, you're actually it's... getting to interact with your fans. It's not just mm-hmm. like a, a piece of paper that you're getting, you know, you get to yeah. actually see the people that made you who you were and you get, there's physical contact and there's communication there's proof. The evidence is right there. It's not just, it's not just a you know a piece of wood that says yeah. your name on it. That's you know I I sound like a freaking Hallmark movie, but like that's the stuff that really gets to you. Yeah. Um, because all I see are just numbers. I cannot, you know, fathom what a hun- two hundred eighty five thousand people look like. I I can't begin to. I've never had two hundred eighty five thousand of anything. It'd be cool if they all gave me like a dollar. That'd be amazing. <laughs> um, a lot of my issues would be solved. But, you know, just seeing people f- who I don't know anything about, but they know everything about me. Kind of like, I, I was thinking about this when you were talking about your tattoos, um, is that people size you up when they're looking at your tattoos. So without even talking to you, someone could look at you and say, okay, this guy probably has pretty good taste in music because you're dead mouse. Uh, he probably is very steadfast in his beliefs and science and evolution because of your, you know, Darwin, that kind of deal. Yeah, It's a lot like that being, right. um, you know, a public, I, I don't want to call myself a public figure, um, <laughs> being someone that a lot of people know about. I think you, that I sounds think you could be called a public, public figure. Maybe like a G class, you know, public figure, <laughs> or G. something like that. Yeah, you know. Well, you're 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 de- you're definitely not a nobody. Yeah, it's it's just this weird middle ground. Yeah. Um, it's like that, you know, where before I talk to somebody, they know everything about me. Right. They know about you know this time I was chased by bees. They know that I got kicked out of a yeah, talent yeah, show. Yeah. They know my religious beliefs. Right. Uh. But I know nothing about them. Exactly. Yeah, I've, and I've, it, I've heard, listening to podcasts, people bring this up all the time, where uh-huh. the fans will come up to them, and the fans will act like they're your best friend because they know so much about you. But it's sometimes it's awkward, or it's uncomfortable, or it feels like they're interfering with your life, because to them, you're like their best friend, but you have no idea who they are. To Sometimes yeah. it comes across as they're just like a psychopath, because... <laughs> of how maniacal they are towards their their favorite creator or whatever. Yeah. And to be fair with that kind of deal, um I really try to contextualize everything. Um 
because most of my audience, they're younger teenagers and stuff like that, you know, 14 to 16 years old. Um, If they, you know, talk to me really, really buddy, buddy, that kind of deal, I get it. It's a very one-sided relationship and they haven't, um, you know, they might just be so excited or something like that that they can't stop and remind themselves, this guy knows nothing about me. I'm a stranger to him. Mm -hmm. You know, even if they feel like they have an intimate relationship with me to a certain degree. Um, And so... I try to remind myself, okay, this is just a kid. But if it's like a fully grown man, you know, like a dude in his 20s, he's like, hey, Nate, hey, yeah. man. I'm like, hi, do I know you? Yeah. What's up? Yeah, I, under- I understand what you're saying. Yeah, for sure. Do you? So do you get recognized just on the street? Like if you're at a mall or whatever? It really depends on where I'm at. If I'm in like Cabela's, yeah. If I'm in like, you know, a country hoedown store, oh God, no. <laughs> yeah. If I'm in like a hot topic, right? if I am at, I was recognized at Disneyland. That was awesome. Oh, wow. Um, you know, if I'm at a music store, um, I get recognized at hot topics. I get recognized at guitar centers a lot. Right. I guess that makes sense. Yeah. You know. Um, Does hot topics still exist? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's still, I worked at hot topic. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I know. A couple months ago. A couple months ago yeah. you worked there? A couple months ago, yeah. Oh, I didn't know it was a couple months ago. Actually closer to a year ago. But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's a couple months. That's yeah. like 12, 13 months, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I wish I had stories about Hot Topic, but it was just a retail store with really shitty music. Yeah, well, you have a whole video about Hot Topic, I think. Don't yeah. You? That was uh, that video was mostly about me being sad, like, well, they don't have Taking Back Sunday merch anymore. Yeah, right. But now, you know, I'm like, it's not for me anymore. Yeah. You know, a lot of my videos, I've really matured a lot. I wouldn't make a lot of those videos or say the things that I said. Right. Well, you know, I definitely can relate to that. Like, a lot of my videos I made from the ages of 12 to 15 years old. <laughs> I I had to delete some of my... Co- I actually had... <laughs> there's this one video I had that was removed from YouTube. You know those Halloween costumes that are, like, inflatable? They've got air in them? Yeah. So I had this costume where it was, like, the Grim Reaper was grabbing onto this guy, and, like, my head was sticking out of the costume. I was the guy that the Grim Reaper was grabbing. And I was 14. It was my Halloween costume. I decided to make this video called <laughs> by the Grim Reaper. and this was this was way before there was any sort of like guidelines on you know any of youtube's restrictions that they have today yeah so you know it was basically just me like bent over the counter getting pretend by this inflatable grim reaper costume oh justin no (laughs) it was let me (laughs) it was funny it was very funny and it was a different time and i was young and stupid Okay. Yeah. But just I like get that. it was last year where YouTube was like, okay, this is not allowed. You're, it's a 14 year old kid in a video <laughs> titled <laughs> by the Grim Reaper. Like, we can't have this. So they gave me five days to remove it and I left it up there. And then it, you know, it just got removed from YouTube. But I actually made a podcast episode where I was like doing commentary over the video. So that's still available on YouTube if anyone is interested in seeing the actual video. Link it in the description. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's 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 um it's the things we do as a kid as children, we just have no idea the repercussions it could have in the future. Yeah. I I really feel that. Um I was born and raised in a really rural farming town in Idaho. Yeah. And um you know, my parents were very conservative, Christian, and I'm basically, I went to I'm, school. I'm in the same oh, yeah. boat. I'm in a rural, yeah. small rural farming community. Lots of uh, conservative people, or I guess Republican, if you want to talk about the United States. Yeah. Um, you know, when I was a kid, my first exposure to homosexuality, um, LGBTQ, was... Um, we had Oprah playing on the TV and some kid was crying and saying that some bullies called him gay. Mm-hmm. And I was like, mom, what's gay? And then she was like, oh, I was hoping I wouldn't have to 
tell you this young. <laughs> it's when a man is in love with a man and it's bad. <laughs> and I was like, oh, gay bad. <laughs> yeah. Mom says so. It's it's an insult to an Oprah. It's an insult from my mom. So it's bad. Right. And, you know, you just don't question it when you're a kid. Yeah. Um, and when someone comes forward and says, hey, being gay, actually pretty cool. Um, you know, you're like, oh, this is different. Get away from me. And, you know, people can either respond uh, aggressively or they can act compassionately. And, you know, when you're formative, when you're a formative kid and you're learning what you value, where you stand, that kind of thing, I think it's really important to be compassionate. Um, because if I didn't have compassionate friends who gave me a different perspective on, you know, racism, homophobia, um, different religions, sexualities, genders, if I didn't have a more positive uh, exposure to that, I'd probably be a dick right now. Yeah. And so I'm so fortunate. But now with the internet, it's a little bit different where you kind of don't have an excuse anymore to be a dick. Mm -hmm. You know, you look like you want to say something. Well, yeah, because that's exactly what I was going to say is with the internet, you know, people are growing up on the internet now. And we're, even if you grow up in a rural part of the world, you're still exposed to these ideas. And it's almost as if, like if I were to grow up in this town that I'm in right now without the internet, I mm -hmm. absolutely would have these stupid conservative views and I would be against whatever, you know, all these um, ideologies of LGBTQ and whatnot. But because I was exposed to the internet, I understand the importance of it and I understand where people are coming from. And even though it's not something I can directly relate to, I can still respect these ideas. Yeah. Makes it a lot more tangible. Yeah. Which is really important. I don't want to imply or anything that, that is up to these, uh, you know, susceptible communities to make their lifestyles, uh, you know, their identities accessible to other people. I'm just saying that it does a lot of good on our end, you know, where I'm not black. And I won't pretend to even understand, you know, what it's like to be a black person in America. Right. But because I have access to a lot of black, you know, culture, art, that kind of thing. Donald Glover was a doorway for me when I was a kid. Um, and now because of that, I feel I can be a bit more empathetic. Again, I don't want to imply I know anything about being black. It's just I am a lot more open than I used to be because, you know, out here in Idaho, we, you know. It's very, very, very white. Yeah. So to have a positive exposure to these things is um, amazing. Right. Anyway, and we are so fortunate to have that. Yeah. And that's something that our parents and grandparents cannot relate to at all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, it's kind of, it's cringy and it's disappointing to listen to a lot of the things that they have to say about certain things, but, you know, they're all going to die off eventually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah we're gonna take over i think yeah i think the world's gonna be super different when i'm their age and yeah. i'm thankful for that i'm excited to see the changes right you know i i also just really quick uh i this is just a, a little disclaimer yeah i guess is i realized that you know i said my first ex exposure to homo uh homosexuality was my mom saying uh that being gay is bad i think it's important for me to update by the way my parents are cool now they've yeah. learned a lot more as well my parents have grown i don't want to throw my parents under the bus on here right uh publicly so that's just a little disclaimer in case mom ever watches <laughs> hi mom <laughs> you know hello thank Nate's you for mom. watching <laughs> yeah thank you for watching this podcast yeah you know? are your parents like supportive in your youtube stuff incredibly yes i i would not be anywhere near where i am now if not for a lot of things you know that are out of my control yeah. uh, including my parents um i'm lucky that my parents are all college educated they have jobs so i don't need to work full time and support you know my family i can spend that time doing youtube right stuff like that so i'm really fortunate in that regard my parents have done a ton of amazing incredible stuff well that's uh, good. for me yeah that's really awesome mm -hmm. right. so do you 
is your in do you have any income from YouTube? Like is that generally where you're making your money from? Um, yes, it has slowed down a little bit, so I'm taking up a few odd jobs and stuff like that in the meantime until stuff picks up. But yeah, for the past few years, YouTube has been my main source of income, which has been so cool. Yeah, I could imagine. You know? I mean, that's the goal for a lot of people. I mean, obviously me as well, but I'm not, I'm nowhere close to even, you know, making any sort of income on YouTube. I am part of the partnership program. I got oh yeah, like I I I got I I'm part I became part of the program like way back in the day when it was just you didn't need a whole lot to actually be accepted into that and so I guess you could say I was grandfathered in mm -hmm. that's a term but yeah like I'm I was not, gonna throw that term at you yeah I'm not I'm not making money like at all even if I wanted that's to, okay like, I'm not at that level yet I gotcha yeah let me see here. I want to shoot you a question. Yes, I would love a question. What do you think about cancel culture? Uh, <laughs> it's okay. This is a safe space. This is a, this is a safe space. I'm not yeah. here to argue or debate. I just want to hear other well, thoughts because this is a really touchy subject. Yeah, it's... You know, I feel like cancel culture is a bit blown out of proportion. I feel like people take things too seriously too quickly and they take it out of context and I'd say for the most part the people who get canceled don't really deserve it mm -hmm. um, there's definitely people who I think deserve it absolutely but people love to just jump on this bandwagon almost immediately when something happens they dig into their, you know, their Twitter feed or their or their Instagram and they just they search and they search and they just dig and they just they're looking for something to destroy this person's lifestyle where yeah. it's not necessary. It's not you know, before the internet existed, we didn't have access to what people did in the past. There was no record of it. Whereas now if you make a tweet 10 years ago, that may be controversial nowadays, it can be used against you. And people don't take into consideration the fact that everyone makes mistakes and everyone changes in life. And you have to accept the fact that these people are willing to admit that they made a mistake and that they're willing to change. You know, every human yeah. being on this planet has to go through some sort of change in their life. Not everyone on this planet stays the same person their entire life. And I hate the fact that the the people who are involved in cancel culture cannot accept that. They feel like if you did something bad, you are done and you cannot be reformed. I feel like that's very unfair. I feel like we need to give people second chances if they're willing to admit that what they did was wrong. Mm hmm. I gotcha. I feel that. That's really sweet. Well, how do you feel? About <laughs> no. It? How do I feel? I think that there are lines that we lay. Um, like, for example, the James Gunn whole deal uh, yeah. where James Gunn, you know, made some dumb tweets years and years ago. You know, that's stupid. Yeah. Like, come on, leave the poor guy alone. That's fine he hasn't acted like that since um he's clearly a much better person like you know it goes back to what we were saying where you know we're so fortunate to have um more positive exposure to things now the world's a totally different place than when he made those tweets right and so i'm just really glad you got his job back yeah. um last time i checked you know something like james gunn i think that cancellation was stupid right um but then you have folks like Kevin Spacey, who, you know, is a predator who has a physical, you know, he's done physical actions to harm people and he's used his position and he's dangerous. Yep. Um, you know, I think that's a good cancellation. Right. Um, you know, or if you have, you know, I've, I've spoken out against a few, I don't want to name any names, 
Uh, I think we both know who we're thinking about. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I've called some people out. Yeah. Um, for stuff that they've said verbally right. and not what they've physically done. Um, but I do think that there is a line that you need to draw with that kind of stuff as well, where you don't have victims who are physically affected. Um, if someone says something stupid when they're a kid on Twitter or something like that to get a reaction or whatever, that's fine. I've, I've said some heinous stuff when I was a kid too. Yeah. And it, a lot of it's still up on the internet for people to find and see. Um, but if you continue to do that after being informed, after having every opportunity to learn from your mistake and not repeat it and better yourself. And then you just find more and more things to dig at, um, whether it be like, uh, I'm totally going to get you demonetized here, stuff like <laughs> uh, the Holocaust, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, All those coming words. at, yeah, coming at transgender people and stuff like that. That is unacceptable, you know, and I think that it's important that for people like that, folks know what they're getting into if they ever decide to work with people like that you know yeah. well like i said it's cancel canceling people mm -hmm. is appropriate for you know certain scenarios but it's blown way out of proportion and i feel like people just feed off of canceling people as soon as they see something controversial said or done with a celebrity or or a person of interest they immediately jump on the opportunity to be like, okay, I got to cancel this guy. He's, I totally agree with you. He's, yeah. He's, they, you know, it's like, it's, it's almost a form of, it's the way it's, it's a form of people to get recognition. They don't have, they don't have a, they don't have fame. They don't have anything in their life. And they just know if they call this person out for doing something, they're going to get, whatever sort of satisfaction they need in their life that they're lacking because people are going to automatically side with them, if that makes any sense. Yeah. There's something satisfying and fun deep down in a lot of people where they get satisfaction from seeing other folks get absolutely torn to shreds. Yeah. Um. I'm empathetic to the point where I don't get that satisfaction watching most folks. You know, I, I have my own moral compass that I plug things into. Um, but I do have a lot of fun watching bad people tumble, you know, right. uh, folks who truly deserve it. Um, you know, um, racists, uh, you know, horrible, awful folks like that. But, you know, right. stuff like James Gunn, a lot of these folks who get in trouble for things that they said 10 years ago. Yeah. You know, yeah. I think an apology and no more repeated actions is all that, you know, we should ask. Do you, have you followed Shane Dawson at all? Are you familiar with his controversy that's going on right now? I, I hear little bits and pieces, stuff that's said on, you know, Philip DeFranco and whatnot. Yeah. That's about the extent of it for but me. But like you, you never watched him as a kid growing up or anything, did you? Thankfully not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I did. I was always a fan of Shane Dawson, especially as a kid. He inspired a lot of what I did. And, you know, I'm not saying that I agree with the shit he did in the past because it's definitely, <laughs> it's definitely questionable, you know, like him jerking off to Willow Smith when she mm. was like 12 or whatever. Obviously, it's a joke, but it's still super inappropriate. Um, yeah. You know, but like when I was watching him back in the day when he was doing stuff like that, the thought of him being controversial or, or disgusting or <laughs> that thought wasn't in anyone's mind at the time. You know, it wasn't like the whole cancel culture th um, w movement or whatever that didn't even exist. So at the time, it was just a funny joke, and everyone deemed it as a funny joke. At the time, no one had any reason to hate Shane Dawson at the time. It was just a funny thing that he did. But now, you know, it's not funny. <laughs> it's super inappropriate. And 
you know, Shane Dawson is like a really touchy subject. Like, I don't even know how to think of how to feel about it. And I know I made a whole episode about, you know, uh, me sort of defending him and, 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 you know, being on his side, but it's still hard to really determine how I feel about the situation because yeah, he definitely did a lot of shit that he should not have done, you know, compared to nowadays standards, but he, um, but it it was never meant, it was never meant in a negative way. You know, you can tell by just watching Shane Dawson, he means well, and obviously it was a joke, but do I think he should be canceled? No, I don't. I honestly don't think he should be canceled because he, he accepts the fact that what he did was wrong and obviously he doesn't do that shit anymore. He's moved on and he's changed as a person. I don't know why we can't accept people who change. We accept prisoners who had a bad past and have reformed themselves and come out as a different person. Why can't we accept these YouTubers who do these shitty things and change? Yeah. I think I'm... You know, I didn't grow up with Shane Dawson. Um, I don't have um, any feelings tied to him. Right. So I might be a little bit harsher yeah. on him than someone who grew up watching him right. would be. Um, you know, but with the stuff that he did in the past, um, I can see that he's demonstrated that he has grown and that he doesn't do that edgy stuff anymore. Um, it was a different time and he has acknowledged many many times that the things that he said and the things that he's done were not acceptable and you kind of need to you know you kind of need to ask what is the appropriate reckoning for this does there need to be a reckoning um <clears throat> you know uh bojack horseman really dug into this you ever watch bojack horseman i watched one episode oh my god <laughs> Well, I I can just tell you it gets better. Oh my god, it turns into the best TV show in the past ten years. Yeah, I I hear um, a lot of good things about it. I definitely need to watch it. Yeah, you might want to break the podcast streak just for this one show, and then you can go back to podcast because yeah. it is well worth it. Uh, basically, BoJack Horseman. Since uh, you haven't seen it, I'll just clue you in. BoJack Horseman is about a '90s sitcom star. Uh, he's all washed up now, and it's just following him trying to restart his career. And as he's doing these things, bits uh, from his past come back to haunt him. Right. Um, so he was dealing with a very similar situation where things that were acceptable in the '90s and the early 2000s, you know, where no one batted an eye if you slept with a fan or something like that. Right. Now he has to deal with these reckonings. Uh, he has to reckon with these things in the 21st century, uh, in 2020, 2019, and with our new uh, cultural expectations for people. And he's frustrated and he's like, well, I didn't. It was a different time back in the day. Um, but I think a lot of it has to do with um, a lot of people didn't have a lot of voices. A lot of people didn't have the voice to chime in and say this is harmful. They were just kind of forced to suffer or, you know, get grumpy in silence. Uh, this is getting further and further away from Shane Dawson. This is just totally different. <laughs> no, but this is interesting. Revenue. Um, and so the show it follows him through years and years, and things just get worse and worse and worse, and he's so mad um at the world and he's just furious and he goes how do i get better uh there's this really great line i guess where he says how do you make something better when you've broken it irreparably or something like that i can't remember there's tons of great one-liners i just butchered that one and the show grapples with that it says what do we do with these people who mean well and have screwed up in the past and you know, I don't want to spoil anything because I do think it's well worth your time. It's well worth anyone watching. Anyone watching, it's well worth their time. Um, it's open for a lot of interpretation, but from what I gathered from the show, it is important for these people who have done these objectively horrible things. It's important for there to be a reckoning of some kind. It is important to get a pound of flesh somehow um, because if there are no consequences for these things, 
um, you know, where do we draw the line? Um, you know, do we draw it before pedophilia or, right. you know, rape, uh, you know, statutory rape and that kind of deal, which is what the show kind of touches on a little bit sometimes. And it's, you know, the show doesn't say that these people can't be good and, you know, that they don't deserve forgiveness. It's just they don't, des- they're, they're not entitled to it from the general public. Right. You know, they can get it from friends. They can get it from family. They can get it internally. Um, and it's kind of their job to better themselves, right. you know. And I'm not super familiar with Shane Dawson or anything like that. As far as I'm aware, he doesn't have, you know, victims. He's never raped anybody. Even his poor cat. <laughs> I hear stories about the cat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, um, with Shane Dawson, I don't, you know, I, I know he's blowing up poorly all of a sudden. Yeah. Um, not in a good way no. recently. And, um, you know, I don't think he's handling it well based on everything I've seen. Right. Um, and I, I I live by this motto, if there's smoke, there's fire. Yeah. You know, if I'm hearing rumors about some guy being creepy, chances are that's because he's creepy. Yeah. You know? That's that's definitely true, and that's something to take into consideration. Um, You know, it's just... Mm-hmm. And like I said, I'm not defending the guy 100%. Like, obviously, I don't know the yeah. full story, but I'm just trying to come from a perspective of, you know, you grow up watching this guy, you kind of develop some sort of, you know, not like immediate relationship, but there's some sort of relationship there. So in a way, it's just, you know, it's just me trying to defend these great memories that I had growing up as a yeah. child watching him. And... I do think it is important to, uh, again, reiterate, you do have a more nuanced uh, view on it than I do. Yeah. Because, you know, I I am not as clued in on this situation as you are. Yeah. Um, You know, but in terms of memories and stuff like that, Shane Dawson has had a positive influence on you. Can we, you know, do you feel that way? Yeah, absolutely. Like, big And do you time. think that, yeah, and do you think that you're a better person for having watched Shane Dawson? Yes, I feel like you know? he inspired me in so many ways to actually pursue the things that I'm doing on YouTube. Yeah, well, it's kind of like that tattoo uh, analogy that we kind of describe, where it is a snapshot of who you were, um, what the situation was like, right? Um, and it's a positive snapshot. And even if you know, years and years later, the person that Shane Dawson has become is not stellar. You know, uh, that doesn't take away the good things that he's done for you. Right. Um, it's just I don't think that you'll be getting many more positive memories from him. It might be time to look somewhere else and right. get some more inspiration from someone else. Yeah. You know, again, for the third time, I am not as clued in as you are. No. These are just my general abstract thoughts being thrown into the wind. Yeah, I I agree 100% with everything you just said. And if it means that I have to cut ties with Shane Dawson and not associate with the things he continues to do in the future, then, you know, that's what needs to be done. But I'll still know that there was a point in time when he was, you know, appropriate for the circumstances. (laughs) Yeah. That has been a recurring theme in 2020 for me that I've found is, um... I've had to cut off ties with a lot of people who I held, you know, really close in my personal circle. Yeah. You know, Um, it's, and again, Bojack Horseman touches on this beautifully. Right. uh, Where, you know, you can, my therapist put this really well, is um, I'm a bit of an old soul. I I grew up really quickly uh, because I needed to in my situation. And basically, that means that I am a bit more, I don't want to say adult, but rather I'm just not interested in a lot of this experimentation that kids do, you know, with, you know, drugs and hooking up and that kind of deal. Like, that's fun and all. It just, it doesn't get me going. Yeah. You know, so I'm an old soul in that regard. And not a lot of people my age are fine with stability 
like I am. They still want to experiment. They still want to try new things and find who they are. I feel like I've found who I am. Yeah. You know, my therapist described it as everyone's trying on new hats in their 20s. Right. And I've just found a really comfy hat early on. And that can be lonely sometimes. Sometimes what I'm finding is I'm developing relationships with people and I'm wearing my hat. I've been wearing the same hat since I was 16, 17 years old. Um, but if I meet someone wearing one hat and then, you know, three years later, they try on a different hat and they're a total douchebag now. Right. And that bums me out. It just comes with the age. Yeah. You know? And so I've had to do that where, you know, someone else changes, but I stay the same. Huh. And, you know, that has completely rattled my life. Um, you know, I was kicked out of my house uh, in January um, cause you know, a shitty breakup where that exact thing happened. Oh yeah. You know? Right. Uh, so I've been living with my, uh, blah, 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 blah. I've been living with my parents just trying to save up yeah. money and that kind of deal. Right. You know, I, I can't afford a room this nice, you know? <laughs> so that's a really interesting you know. perspective that your therapist brought to you. And I feel like yeah. that might be, you know, contributing to the to the reason why you became such such a success on YouTube is that you f- you already had it figured out. You you're done with the experimentation, and people can see what you have to offer. I appreciate that. And you know, I I you know I talked about you with other people, but I had no oh, idea yeah. who you were or what you did. But when you know when I started communicating with you and then you said you were willing to come on the podcast obviously i had to look into your stuff and see what it is that you did and i gotta say like your content is like amazing and i love it and i've actually become a fan of your content and i think what you're doing is incredible like you thank you you've you've got it figured out absolutely and i respect i really appreciate that yeah you know it's I really appreciate that. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that you're a pretty stellar host as well. Yeah. Well, thank you. You know, but, um, it's good. It's good to, I take a lot of inspiration from a lot of YouTubers, but I still haven't got it figured out. I feel like Mm -hmm. I'm doing what needs to be done to make it on YouTube. Other than the fact that I don't promote my shit. Like, do you have, did you promote your stuff in the, in the beginning? How so? Because there's a lot of different ways you can promote yourself. Right. Well, like I promote it on Twitter and like all the social media platforms and whatnot, but I don't have, there's no, uh, there's no audience on my Twitter or any of my social media to actually respond and see what it is that I'm promoting. So like, how did, how did your content reach an audience? What did you do? I gotcha. Um, the thing is, is that promotion, when you're just starting out, is a waste of your time. It's a waste of your money. Um, don't promote on Twitter. You know, maybe Reddit, you know, if you get lucky or something like that. Yeah. But promotion without an audience is, you know, that's kind of dumb, stupid. Don't do that. Yeah. You know, um, instead, I found that the best promotion tool is YouTube itself. Um, I you know, through that month of, you know, homework, studying, uh, you know, to become a YouTuber, everybody had the exact same message, tags, tag your videos. YouTube is the second largest search engine on the planet besides Google. Um, And if you're not making your stuff accessible um, to that search engine, if it doesn't know what to do with your video, when people are searching for things, when people are watching videos, you know, the related stuff. Right your video is not going to go anywhere. Um, So tags, number one, most important bit, tag your freaking videos and just use all your tags. I exhaust the 500 character limit tags on every single video. um, And I saw a difference. Right. Um, Second bit is uh, thumbnails, you know, make your thumbnails look good. Make your thumbnails look snappy. Uh, yeah. You know, I'd recommend a few, you know, not to you, just to anyone in general. Uh, you know, watching, there's tons of free tutorials on everything on YouTube. If you want to learn how to make flashier, better thumbnails, right? check that out, you know. And finally, uh, titles, you know. You want to emphasize what's important, mm-hmm. um, what's going to grab people, 
you know, if someone is doing like a series, like, you know, the da, 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 episode one, and then, you know, they put their interesting title, that's not going to cut it, put the interesting stuff first. Right. You know, you just got to be really competitive in the sense that you are fighting with 10 other videos. You got to make your video stand out. You got to give people an idea of what they're getting into and why they should care. Yeah. You know? And I'm I'm definitely aware of everything you just said. Oh, yeah. And I try to implement that. Like, I have a format for my thumbnails. Mm -hmm. Generally, all my thumbnails follow the same format where the, the episode number's in the corner, the title's at the bottom, and, you know, I have, like, this goofy face in the thumbnail, and then I usually have, like, two celebrities in there as well mm -hmm. based on whatever it is that I'm talking about. And then... But with the tags, I definitely did do the tagging thing a lot in the past. Because I, yeah. you know, I, I was aware of the fact that tags are super important when people are searching and with the algorithm and whatnot. But then when I was listening to other people talk about tags, they I was under the impression that for some reason nowadays the tags and the actual tag section is not as important as what you put in the actual description of the YouTube video. Like the algorithm picks up what's the words in the description more than it does in the tag section. And, you know, whether or not that that's true, I have no idea. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, so I, so I, so I kind of stopped using the tag section, but I guess maybe I should start using it again. <laughs> the, the algorithm, yeah, it changes all the time. Um, I was just in a panel. I wasn't on the panel. I was attending the panel. Um, man, I'd be so much fun in a panel. <laughs> <laughs> um, basically I have a friend of mine who's like this YouTube analytics nut. He's amazing. Um, and he was giving me, um, an audit on my channel telling me what I could do better. Right. And you know, the stuff that he was telling me to do was so much different than what I learned in that formative month back in 2017. Right. Where now apparently the algorithm is pushing simpler, uh, you know, thumbnails with less stuff going on and you know apparently doesn't like words or phrases in thumbnails anymore okay uh it it changes all the time and it is so yeah random and ridiculous and so you know i went through and i changed i removed you know text from my past few thumbnails and that kind of deal okay um it just it changes all the time and so i'm finding that i need to stay on top of that a bit more Right, but it's um, it's and, hard. Like, where do you get the information of how, of what's changing? Um, I've I found a lot of YouTube channels that just do that. Oh, okay. Um, video makers, and you know, if you just look up YouTube tutorial, there will be channels that are just dedicated to every facet of what it takes to become a YouTuber. Right. You know. Yeah, I've never. Th I guess I never thought about doing that. That is definitely it's, a good thing to do. It's made a world of difference for me. It right. has changed my life. Yeah. You know? So. Because I'm just basing off everything off of what I've heard other YouTubers tell me, but I've never, like, gone out there and searched for what it is I need to find. I'm just doing what that's, I think I need to do. That's definitely what I recommend yeah. everybody. Everybody do. If they're interested in becoming a YouTuber, you got to get the nitty-gritty stuff down. Right. Um, You know? I've been letting that slip, so I probably need to get back into that as well. So <laughs> reminding me, yeah. anyway, it's it's been a it's been a mess past few years. Anyway, right. So, I read online that you started a punk rock music festival. Is that true? Yes, it is. Yes, that is. You started that it. Is, I started it. That, it's actually a good story if you want to hear it. I do want to hear it. So basically, what happened was um, I was in this really awful, awful, awful shitty band. Um, and we were called Cadis. Um I love Cadis. I love their music. We just weren't very good. And Was it the same was... genre that Raccoon Tour is? No, it was more like 2005. Like we were going for a Taking Back Sunday, brand new kind of vibe. Okay. While Raccoon Tour is a little bit more My Chemical Romance meets 21 Pilots. Yeah. And let me just pull this up. And shot. And so that's not working. 
basically, we were playing bars. And I was 16 years old at the time, so I was just playing in bars. Okay. And it sucked. Nobody came because most of the people that we were trying to, you know, advertise to were under 21. Right. And so what happened was uh, I was like, you know what? Why don't we just play in my city park? And so I was like, how do I do that? So I went to my town hall and I was like, hey, guys, you know, I'd like perched up on the counter. I was like, how do I make this happen? And they're like, fill out these forms. Give us this insurance. Do this, do that. We need like seven hundred dollars. I was like, oh, God, where do I get money? They're like, I don't know. Go find sponsors. So I was like, OK. Huh. So I went to like mom and pop shops around town. I was like, hey, do you guys want to give me money? <laughs> and I'll like show your name and like, oh, it's so cute. It's like a teenager boy trying to do a, you know, a concert. Wow. Uh, sure. And so I was like, oh, cool. So I went back to City Hall and I was like, here's the money. And they're like, oh, okay, here's the dates. Here's the time. And I was shit. like, oh, cool. And so I went to town and I started making like advertising posters and they were good. You know, I'd like um, Photoshop goosebumps, book covers and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. And throw all the information on there. What happened though was that because I said it's a very conservative farming town. Yeah. A lady found one of the designs that I had. And basically it was just me holding a platter of muffins. And I whited out my eyes to look like it was pos- I was possessed by the devil or something like that. It was a silly, silly little video uh, picture. <laughs> and, you know, it was, it was a meme. It was like, hey, come to my concert, you know. Right. And it was done by a 16-year-old boy. It's, it's dumb. And what she did was uh, she went on all of the Facebook, uh, you know, groups in my town. And she just posted this crazy rant. And as I'm speaking to you, I'm trying to pull it up because it is the funniest, funniest shit you've ever seen. Oh, Here boy. it is. Oh, nice. I found it. Would you like me to read it yes, to you? Yes, absolutely. All right. <clears throat> Calling all concerned CUNA citizens, especially my fellow true believers, be bold in your faith as unbelievers are bold in their sin. This quote has been lingering in my mind for the past few days until someone showed me one of these promo flyers for CUNA Punk in the Park. After I saw these flyers myself checking out their Facebook website, CUNA Punk in the Park, and the organizer's personal Facebook. I was 16 at the time. (laughs) Oh, I love this. I was troubled and concerned for our community and our youth in particular. In this this reason I am posting this. Please don't be deceived by these nice articles in the newspaper and say to yourself this is harmless. Remember, we are not going up against flesh and blood, nor our youth and kids. They are not our enemy, but rather against the powers of this dark world and against what? the spiritual forces of evil. What? <laughs> what? I'm not making this up. I'm not making this up. I'm reading this. That's insane. Uh, she says... Please check the promo flyers below, especially the kid with three cupcakes in his hand. I wish I had a picture to show you, but it's just me throwing. Yeah. Uh, so on those pictures, I, I you know, photoshopped uh, frosting on them. And so I did like a skull. I did an anarchy sign. I did like a pentagram yeah. on muffins. You know, it's the most inoffensive thing you've ever seen. Right. The symbols on top of the cupcakes represents anarchy, sign of the devil, and death. His (laughs) eyes are demon-possessed, and the phrase says, your soul belongs to me. It's a five-year-old kid with muffins. Yeah. She's freaking out. Jesus. Other flyers suggest drugs, witchcraft, perversion, and in specific, the perversion thing. I uh, Shia LaBeouf was really cool, so he was like, "Do it!" Oh yeah. And she thought he was gesturing towards his uh, his pee pee, <laughs> and so she was like, "It's perverted. Oh, it's horrible." Oh my god. I don't know where like the drugs and the witchcraft is coming from because I did like a kitten in space, and apparently that means like acid or something. I guess. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Oh, God. And a friend of mine said, yeah, man, I've been advertising this on Pornhub. So she freaked out. This is the funniest shit. This advert. God, this event was advertised in a Pornhub website. Satan's (laughs) rock and roll site. You guess who's going to be attending? Is that what we want for our community? For our kids and grandkids? It's your choice. But I'm pleading for you to start praying right now until this event, May 13th. Please pray that the enemy's plan will not prevail, but God's plan will be accomplished through this event. And then she just quotes a bunch of Bible verses. Oh my goodness. She posted that, and it went 
viral. It went nuts. People were like, what? This is like Footloose stuff. Wow. And I am so lucky and so fortunate that a woman that crazy had the gusto to call me out. Uh-huh. And so since that blew up, everyone in town was like, hey, fuck this lady. I'm going to go to this event oh, just to nice. make her angry. So we were expecting like 10, maybe 15 people to show up, just like my personal friends to come watch us play in the park. Yeah. We had 800 RSVPs. Oh, my God. I was like, oh, so God, she, so okay. So she helped you. She did. She, the, the, the event would not be a success without her. Damn. And so I was like, oh God, so I need to get some more groups playing. So we got like this brutal screamo group and like just, it was, um, it was wonderful. So in this rural small town, you have like these shrieking guitars and bands playing. Oh my God. Um, and we sold t-shirts. What we did was I took that design that she hated, absolutely hated it. I wonder if I have it. Hang on. Could yeah. you hold on for yeah, like yeah, 10 yeah. seconds? Yeah. I might have it in my closet. Okay. <laughs> That's a nice closet. Is it there? I wonder. It doesn't look like it's there. <laughs> I do not have it. Yeah. I figured. Basically, I just, I traced the design and threw it on a white t-shirt. Yeah. You know? Uh, we made the t-shirts for two fifty dollars each, and we sold them for like $10, $15, and we sold out. <laughs> nice. That's awesome. Uh, and since it had like muffins, we went to Costco, and we just handed out muffins with every shirt sale. <laughs> Dude, that's and so cool. And so, it was amazing. Uh, they showed up. They picketed. They protested the punk rock show. And I had papers given to me from the town hall saying, okay, if you get protesters, here's what you do. Okay. Um, I had the ability to kick them off the property. Wow. So, you know, they showed up on the, you know, the park and I walked up with my clipboard as like a 16 year old boy wearing the t-shirt <laughs> of the Trace promo flyer that we were selling like hotcakes. So I made like 800 bucks. We threw it to a mental health charity in their name. Oh, yeah. Um, and I got to look at them and say, hey... Uh, please get off the property or else I'll call the police. Uh, you're designated over there, you know, telling all these baby boomers and stuff, uh, <laughs> you know, with Bibles. And right. It was amazing. Did they listen to you, the protesters? Oh, they had to or else I would be able to call the police, you right. know. Right, okay. So it was so empowering and so cool. And that was like when I was 16. We did it again. Um, this time since it was so big, I, I had no problem getting uh, money for sponsors and stuff. We got real bands. We wow. got big bands from like Seattle and California playing in this like tiny little farm, you know. That's so cool. Middle of nowhere. That's awesome. I don't, yeah, I don't know if you listen to like the genre or anything like that. We got a band called The Frights. They're yeah. blowing up. We have a band called Honey. Um, they're massive. I still see Honey every now and then. Like, yo, you're the kid who did the uh, little farm town gig, and I was like, yeah, that was cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Is it is the festival still active every year? No, it's too expensive. <laughs> oh. No, yeah. and it takes up months of my time. I cannot right. begin to do that. I want to do one more, you know, because uh, since then I've made a lot of friends uh, in the music industry, and so I could get some pretty sizable groups if I wanted to. Right. It's just a matter of coordinating. So I just want to do one more huge event for my hometown, which I love. I love that stupid little town, even if it is gross and gentrification and stuff <laughs> like that. Yeah. You know? Well, you grew up Just, there. I grew up there. I'm all the better for it. So, you know, I owe them one more really good show for all the, you know, kids who were like me growing up. Yeah. Did, you know? Did you, did you play at the music festival? The first year I did uh, with a really bad band, and we were following up a really good band. Oh, yeah. So everyone was like, oh... So we just had a lot of crossed arms after, like, mosh pits and stuff. And I was like, yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know, like, they were there out of, you know, respect. Like, they're expected to be here. Yeah. You know, this kid threw the thing. This is the least we can do. Yeah. So, you know, so, like... Right. How much longer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, you know? just giving you what you needed at the time. Yeah, it was pretty great. Um, and so, it was awesome. It was great. Did, um, did you have like vocal training? No. Or anything? No. You just oh no. You just figured it out on your own. 
Yeah, for the most part. Um, because like the 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 screaming aspect is very complicated to figure out without hurting your vocal cords, right? Yes, and I hurt my vocal cords when I do it. So you don't do it properly. Oh God, no, no. Okay. Uh, I I really try not to scream when I don't need to. Yeah. You know, I'm trying to move away from that sound with my personal music. Okay. You're trying you to, know. so you're, you, you don't want to do that anymore? Nah, I, I have one track like that called Sorry Sarah. Um, well, I guess, which that, might I be guess, I guess of. that's the only one I'm really referencing is that one in particular. Yeah, I gotcha. It's, it's fun to play. It's really fun live. Um, it's just, I don't like it. Yeah. You know? I know a lot of that's that's something weird. I was talking with a friend of mine about this. Sometimes, as an artist, um, you can make something that you're not in love with, but someone else is all over it. Someone else thinks it's awesome, but you're like, I don't get it. This sucks. Yeah, you know, why would you like this when I have this over here? That why happens, aren't you paying attention? That to this? happens more often than not, actually. Yeah, you know, because you know, I have songs. Uh, I I actually um. I, have you seen any of the memes about my upcoming raccoon tour album? No. Basically, I I promised the album would be out um, in summer 2018, uh-huh. and it's summer 2020, and there's still nothing. Radio silence okay. on my band's album, and because you know a lot of kids are really excited about it, yeah. Um, everyone has been making memes uh, on Instagram and stuff like that. They're so funny. They're so creative. Right. Um. And basically, I have an album. Um, I'm not super happy with it yet, but I've had a few people listen to it. And they're like, hey, this song's great. And I'm like, why do you like this song? This song sucks, you know? Yeah. Um, it's, it's just a weird place. Do you, do you like master all your music? Do you do the full production? I do not. I'm not smart enough for that. Okay. Um, I get help from an incredible, amazing team. Something uh, that's really amazing about YouTube is that the audience that you create here doesn't stay here. It follows you. So if I were to write a book, my book is in front of all these people. If right. I were to start a, you know, a band, my band is in front of a lot more people than if I was just starting off out of nowhere. Yeah. And um, it's cool because I have help from people who I grew up listening to now. Right. Um, I'm, you know, I signed a contract, I'm not allowed to give away specifics or anything like that. Um, but, you know, I'm getting to interact with these producers, uh, managers who manage my childhood heroes and stuff like that. And their interest in the things that I do, wow. um, not only from an artistic standpoint, but also because I have an audience to back for it. Yeah. So that's like a golden combination. Right. Um, and so because of that, I have higher expectations for myself. They have higher expectations for me. That's kind of why the album's taken so gosh darn long. Right. You know? Well, do you know Do you know Oliver Tree? Yeah, of course. Love Oliver Tree. Yeah, like when you were saying that he, um, he was, you know, or you were saying that you had a lot of memes about how you didn't release your album or whatever, like he's kind of in the same boat. Although he did just release his album yesterday. Oh, God. Yeah. His uh, ugly, his beautiful album. He's all. He also did a live stream today. With was it with Fantano? No. He, okay. He did a live stream today where he had the world's largest scooter and he was on his stilts and he was gonna drive it the farthest distance or whatever. Like I, I love Oliver Tree. I've been following him a lot lately. And That's awesome. He's he's kind of approaching the music industry in an in a very interesting way where he established himself as this goofy character with like the bowl cut and the kind of like what I'm wearing right now like shit like this. Mm-hmm. And so once he establishes himself as this weird character, he's dropping it completely like this is his only Oliver Tree album. He's going to remove this persona and since he's already gathered the fans from the Oliver Tree character He's going to use those fans and turn himself into something that he actually wants to be. This was just a way for him to establish an audience, if you know yeah. what I'm saying. And I respect that. Yeah, you know, he's. I think that's he's so great. Kind of like what he's like a Joji. Yeah, exactly like that. Started off as Filthy Frank, 
turned himself into what he wants to do. I mean, I miss Filthy Frank, though. Oh, I know. I know. Oh, God. You can't cancel Filthy Frank. <laughs> you know? Oh, man. Many have tried. Yeah. I was so disappointed when I heard that he was no longer going to do anything associated with Filthy Frank. Like, did you hear, you know his Pink Guy character? Yeah. Yeah. He had an album released under the Pink Guy name. Did you hear any of those songs? Uh, I, I really can't do meme songs, you know? No, I, I know, but they're they're so good, though. Like, in a bad way, <laughs> they're, they're well worth yeah. to listen. I gotcha. Um... Yeah, I feel I have a lot of friends who really like that album. I just, you know, I need, I can't have my music be uh, jokes because the thing is, you songs are made to be listened to many, many times. And if your song is a joke with a punchline or like a silly premise or something like that, um, there's only so much you can do with two or three minutes that's designed to be looped over and over right. again. You know, same thing for me with show tunes. I can't listen to Broadway music because that's a scene, you know, in a story. Right. You know, I can't listen. I'm walking up the stairs. I'm talking to my mom. <laughs> I'm feeling pretty sad about what happened at school. Yeah. No, I, yesterday. I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. I guess I've never really thought about it like that before. <laughs> yeah. Um. I used to be a theater kid. Yeah. You know, Ta-da. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you, did, you, you know, did a lot of theater in high school or... Did you go to college uh, or anything? No, no. Um, I did most of it in elementary, middle school, and high school. That's when I started trying my own stuff. Oh, yeah. Um, and I never went to college. Probably a bad idea. We'll see. Um, well, I just focused, honed in on YouTube, um, trying to do that. I think, I think, anyway. I think, you know, college isn't necessary for everyone. And so far, from what I'm seeing, you're heading in the right direction without college. I try my hardest. Yeah. Um, some of the best advice I ever got from someone was don't go to college unless you know exactly what you want to do. Yes. Um, and I, I think I know what I want to do. I want to do YouTube. I want to do music because um, I've been working another job and it is miserable and I hate it and I feel terrible. You know, like the night before and the morning before, just anticipating and waiting oh, for having yeah. to work again. Yeah. Miserable. I can't be happy unless I'm drawing something, if, unless I'm talking about something. Right. Um, or if I'm not, you know, playing a song or something like that. I can't be happy. Right. Um, I, I'd I, like to I really... I definitely can relate to oh, that. Yeah. I've, yeah. I've had multiple jobs in the past where it's just like, this is the worst it's the absolute uh-huh. worst. And you but it's like you can't just leave the job cuz you you need the money, you know? Yeah. Uh you know, I I don't know if you can keep a secret or not. <laughs> um I actually I played hooky today so I could focus on a video. Oh. <laughs> you know, I called and I'm sick and uh Yeah, well we we've, we've all been there. You know, I'm sure yeah. I'm sure they're going to they don't necessarily need you there. Yeah, to to be fair, they they don't. You know, I'm just in a, I'm just a tiny cog in their horrible multi-billion dollar machine. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know. Right. So it's uh it's like that. I just I can't be happy unless I'm doing something like this. Yeah. Um and you know, if I lose the ability to do something like that, I you know, I'd probably kill myself. I don't know what I'd do. <laughs> yeah. Um no. I'd like to do this until I can't, and then it'd be cool to go to school and become like a teacher or something like that. Right. You know, I I think I'd be pretty fun as a high school English teacher. Yeah. Anyway. I think so as well. You got a lot of charisma. And you said like your English teacher was like one of your best friends growing up, and that was, I, I'm i the same way. Like I had an English teacher who was I was super close with, and he related to a lot of the things that I was interested in. Like he was he was my English teacher, he was also my art teacher and Yo. and my digital media teacher. This guy sounds awesome. Yeah, he was <laughs> he was involved in like all the arts and That's like the holy trifecta yeah. of the cool teacher. Yeah. Well, the only reason it was like that is because I'm in a small town where like from kindergarten to grade 12, it's all in one school and there's only 300 kids in the whole school. That is so, really small. Yeah, there's no, 
there's no other teachers around. So he had, he was the only guy who could do all that stuff. Did you go to that school your entire life? No, I'm originally from the eastern part of Canada in Nova Scotia. Like in there, I went, I was in a, a pretty massive city, you know, from grade, from kindergarten to grade nine. I was okay. in Nova Scotia, but then high school, I was here where I'm at now from high school till, you know, the age I'm at right now. I feel you. I was, I was just like, imagine, I'm just imagining you being a kindergartner in that school and then seeing like 18 year olds, you know, with tattoos or smoking cigarettes or something walk by and you're like, whoa. Yeah. Well, that's a monster. Well, that's what it's like for the kids who grew up here. Yeah. I can't imagine because I went to a charter school um, my sophomore year miserable little school uh but it was a lot like that yeah um but especially in the high school sector they had a they had a sectioned off they had the high school seniors they had couches they had sofas in the commons room oh, okay and if you weren't a senior you were not allowed to sit in that couch right and so it was like this moment i'm just getting flashbacks to that school right now <laughs> whoa uh if you weren't a senior uh, you could not sit there. They would beat your butt. They would wreck you. Right. Um, if you were lucky, you'd get invited to sit okay. with the seniors. But it was like that divide yeah. that is really weird. And then when you become a senior, you're like, wow, this is a disgusting couch. Right. It's not as good you as know? you thought it would be. Yeah. Yeah. Because I snuck on that couch after school some days. And I was like, this sucks. There's like a dead mouse in here. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's, it's only cool if you're not allowed to do it. Yeah, that's how it is with most things I've yeah. found. Yeah. You know, I don't want to work on YouTube videos until I'm skipping work to do it. You know, if right. I have all day to do it, then I'm like, I don't want to do this. Yeah, it's so true. Like this whole coronavirus thing, I'm like, okay, I'm quarantined. I have, you know, that's all I have to do is make videos. I have all this time now. <laughs> and then it's like, I don't even do it. Yeah, I feel that, you know, yeah. I spent months and months and months this year just not doing anything productive right it's almost like you need it's like you need to cram everything into your day in order to feel motivated to do something like you're like oh i only have this short window of time to actually make this video so i have to do it but when you have all the time in the world you're like ah, i can wait till tomorrow and then it yeah you turn into a big procrastination thing you know, you just perfectly described um, terror management theory. Right. Right there a little I bit. Saw that, I saw that video, yeah. <laughs> a little bit of philosophy, you know. Yeah. Man, if that we have vid- all the time in the world, why do anything? That video was, I really enjoyed that video of yours. Well, thank you. It was you. super informative. I appreciate that. Was there a lot of research put into that video or was that like basically stuff you already kind of knew? <clears throat> There wasn't a whole lot of research. Um, I just needed to find the scientific term for what I was thinking. Yeah. You know, generally I'm like, <clears throat> you know, I I put that together myself where, you know, the reason that we do anything at all is because we're going to die someday. Right. And so I was like, there's no way I'm the first person who thought about this. <clears throat> and turns out I'm not. <laughs> yeah. uh, someone beat me to it. They gave a name. They wrote a book about it. They win. Right. Uh, so I needed to call it by that, you know. So that was the only... Uh, research that i did anyway but i don't put a lot of research into that kind of stuff unless i'm just pulling up specific facts right yeah you know yeah you're i gotcha your videos are like they're incredible i love every thank one you of them. i love every single one of them i appreciate that yeah <clears throat> and like you watch them and you think like man this guy must put like hours and hours of research into it but i guess you don't i I don't. Um, I've just been around, you know. Uh, I I like to learn things mm-hmm. a lot, so I just pick up dumb, useless facts. Like, did you know that a turtle can breathe out of its anus? A what? A turtle oh. can breathe out of its anus. I think I actually have heard that before. Yeah, good stuff. <laughs> you know, I just, I want to be... Full of useless information so I can charm people on first dates. Right. You know? Um, Because that's that's how I got my girlfriend anyway. I just took her around town and taught her a lot of little tidbits about 
you know, the local history out here and stuff like that. Oh yeah. And she's been dating me for the past six months, so I think I whittled her uh, <laughs> standards down enough. You know, cool stuff like that. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I appreciate that. Did you? But not. Like your business email says, what is it, Kuna Movie Review or something? Yeah, yeah. Um, Are you were you trying to do a movie review channel at one point? <laughs> so what happened was um, when I was a kid, I'm talking like eight years old. I went to go see the Diary of Wimpy Kid movie, and I thought it was like the best movie ever made by anybody ever. Right. Incredible. And I was like, I just feel so excited. I need to tell people about this. Uh -huh. So I wrote the worst movie review you've ever seen because I was like <laughs> eight or nine or 10. And I submitted it to my local newspaper. And I was like, print this. Yeah. Put it on the front page. <laughs> this is the best movie. I need to tell someone about this. And they actually printed it. Wow. Um, That's cool. And I was like, oh, this is really neat. Uh, I'm in a newspaper. I want to do this again. So I started writing movie reviews as a kid and they were awful reviews, but the novelty of this movie review being written by a child was enough for them to keep on printing them. I didn't get paid or anything. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I, I opened up a, an email for people to email me in, you know, when I'm like 11 or 12 years old and they're like, can you review Kung Fu Panda 2? <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I got older and I quit doing those awful movie reviews uh, but the thing is, by that point, that email had dripped into every facet of my personal life. Oh, you yeah. know, yeah. So I was like, okay, this is now my YouTube. Uh, my YouTube's tied to this horrible email. Right. I guess I will just leave this forever. I see. Yeah, I was curious. You know, I when I started YouTube, uh, like a year into it, there used to be this trend on YouTube where like these old creepy men would like review children's toys. And for Ugh. some, for some reason I got into that and I was only a child. So I'm like, I'm going to review toys from a child's perspective. So I created this channel called the review Opolis, and I put up three videos, one of me reviewing like a Rubik's cube and another one of me reviewing the, the toy soldiers from toy story. And then there was this other toy. I can't remember. And then I just stopped it. I stopped the channel. I stopped doing any content on there. I logged out, never logged in. And then like Smart. just <laughs> And then just last year, I logged in and like the fucking I've got like over I don't remember like over 200 subscribers. There's like each video has like over 10,000 views. And I'm like, "What the fuck? <laughs> What's go I did I forgot about this shit." And so I'm like, that's "If I was awesome. stuck with that, what could I have turned that into? I don't know if that's what you want to do when you're no, 26 years old, though. <laughs> not at all. But I'm like, that was, you know. it's just one of those things where, like, the stuff that you don't expect to go viral, just like the songs that you make, you don't expect people to enjoy as much as the other ones. That's the shit that fucking blows up. The stuff that you want to do good doesn't do good. Yeah. What's up I feel with that? that? I, you know, I don't know. Sometimes people can just be kind of a hive mind and you might accidentally tickle that hive mind and like, oh, we want more of this. Yeah. But you're like, why? This sucks. I don't know. I, you know, it's easy to go down that road and sound really elitist Yeah. or something. It's just so weird how, how people make it on the internet. It's very. Normally it's just by ditching all your self-respect. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You know? Like, my first big, big, big video was, you know, my issues with Twin One Pilots when I was 17 years old. Right. And, you know, the thumbnail had Tyler Joseph and Josh Dunn right there in the thumbnail. And so people click on it for Twin One Pilots content, and then they get a little bit of me. Right. Um, I don't want to do that. I don't want people to come to my videos for someone else's art, yeah. you know? Right. So <clears throat> I want them to come to me for me. Exactly. You know, even if it gets fewer clicks, it kind of ties into that thousand fans thing that I brought up at the beginning. Yeah. Where even though I'm getting fewer clicks, those people are more engaged with me. Yeah, exactly. You know? And not everybody thinks that way. There's a lot of people on YouTube just for the numbers. 
like Logan Paul or Jake Paul. Yeah. Audiences aren't stupid. They can see right through that. You know, just assume that your audience is smart. Yeah. And they'll be appreciated. Right. You know. Well, we're two hours and four minutes in. Um, I think, oh, my God. I think this is a good time <laughs> to probably wrap it up around here, but is there anything else you wanted to talk about? Um, i just like to say that you have been an absolutely stellar host, really easy to talk to, very easy to flow and bounce off of, and this has been one of the best podcasts I've been on in ages. So well, thank, thank you. you, thank you, thank you for having me on and giving me your time. Of course. Well, you know, I appreciate the kind words, and I appreciate the fact that you were even willing to come on here. I mean, this is... Hopefully this is going to help me out a little bit. Um, you know, I, I, I'll ask you to plug anything you want, obviously, but uh, I doubt it's going to help you at all because I'm a nobody. <laughs> well, you know what? Uh, I, I suggest everyone watching check out my channel because, you know, it's really sad. <laughs> and I recommend everybody listen to my awful band. We might have an album here in the next few months. Who knows? Yeah, hopefully. Uh, raccoon tour. I mean, you're gonna throw the links. You know, yeah. I don't need to tell them where to go. Yeah, all the you links got me are covered. gonna be where the links are normally at. And with that being said, that's it for this episode of the Dynamite Gizmo podcast. I hope you enjoyed. Uh, please like, comment, subscribe, smash that bell notification. You know what it is. I don't have to say it. <laughs> that's it, everyone. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>